Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. I was a little late on my cue. I apologize. I got caught. I was watching the video in the back. I was like, oh yeah, I think I should probably go out. Um, hey, my name is Chris. I get to serve as the youth and young adult pastor here at Arundel Christian Church. We're excited you're here on our Christmas Eve Eve. I learned backstage that's what it's called. First service was not so pretty. Um, I, I think I, I was, anyways, it's bad. It's not recorded, so it's great. Uh, so we're glad you're here for our Christmas Eve Eve service. Uh, tomorrow night is going to be incredible as well. I want to invite you to come back for that. It's going to be different than today. It's going to be fantastic, so make sure you're here. Uh, if you uh, have never been here before or you don't know anything about me, let me just explain something up front that's kind of a little weird. Uh, for people, I do know that it's winter, and I do know that it's cold outside, and I can't afford shoes. So before you kind of like throw me under the bus for that, um, whenever I teach, I always teach without shoes on. Uh, it's, a, it's for me a conviction out of Scripture in the book of Exodus. Uh, Moses has this encounter with, with God. And God tells him to take off his shoes because the ground in which he's standing on is holy ground. And you can go walk on that ground. Like you can go to Mount Sinai today and go walk along the dirt. And so the question always has been in my brain, like, why did Moses take his shoes off? That's weird. The only thing that changed wasn't the dirt. It was that God was there. And so I believe that this morning, you sitting in the room and me standing on stage, that God is here. His presence is here. And so just out of respect and honor before him, uh, I remove my shoes when I teach. I don't ask you to do that. Some of you, I ask you to do the opposite. That's totally fine, uh, but it is something that for me, it's just kind of a, and I'd love to have more conversation if you'd like to about that. Another weird thing about me is I love Christmas. I love Christmas decorations. Uh, this is our house this year. We, uh, that's honestly scaled back a little bit because we ran into some problems with the roof. Uh, for some reason, so we have like a really steep roof. So these three blocks that you can see are kind of out. We just decided I can't get up there to fix them, so we just told everybody that we made a robot, and uh, people believed it, so it's fine. Uh, but no, we love Christmas. De I do. I love Christmas decorations, um, even to the point where my wife kind of gets a little annoyed with me about it, because like, if there's something that you throw like on the side of the road, you know, like you're going to th throw it away, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going to put it in my car. Like if, if I pass a dumpster, and there's like a cool thing in there that I really want, I'm going to get it, and I'm going to put it in my car, I'm going to take it home, and I'm going to fix it. I guess for me, uh, that's a joy. For her, that is the worst thing about me. And so it's fine. Well, I'm not going to bring you into our issues. I'm just letting you know what they are. And so, <clears throat> but it's for me, like, it's kind of bringing life back to some of these things that, that have been broken or tattered or left to the side. Like, things that, if you and I were to look at them uh, on face value, you'd probably say, like, they don't have a lot of worth. They can't really do much. But, but when put back into practice, when shown that they can truly have purpose again, will actually shine. And it's pretty incredible. And so for you and me, in this generous series, we've been talking about ways that you and I can be generous. Uh, and so for, for us, like we've been kind of really encompassing around this singular truth that Jesus came and became a man 
and lived among us. That's the whole purpose of Christmas. The, the beauty of Christmas is that God became flesh and dwelt among us. He came and lived among us. The, the beauty of Christmas doesn't stop there, or it would just be another baby being born, right? The beauty of Christmas is that that baby born in Bethlehem grew up and, and lived a, a perfect life and died a death for you and for me. And so we, we've been looking, like, how do we imitate Jesus' ministry? Like, you look at Jesus' ministry, and there are a couple things that stick out, right? Like, think about how Jesus spent his time. He spent his time with people, whether it was one person or a multitude. Jesus was always with people as best he could be. Or you think about his talents, whether that's doing miracles or just teaching, Jesus used his talents as well. Or you think about uh, how, he, how he gave of basically the, the greatest gift of all, right? His life. A, a sacrifice that's unmatched. And so for you and I, we've kind of been looking at this passage over the last few weeks in, in Ephesians chapter 5. I want to read it to you to kind of to close out today's uh, kind of this big idea of generosity. I think we need to look at it one last time. So take a look with me in Ephesians 5. It'll be on the screen. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Jesus. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So we've been talking about what does it look like to imitate God. And, and maybe out of these first three weeks, you've taken that you need to give a bunch of money in order to be generous. And I hope that's not the case. But definitely today, uh, you can leave your wallets where they are. Because I'm not talking about money today. I'm going to talk about generosity with our hands being open. There are four ways that we've talked about generosity. We've talked about our, our minds being open, our eyes being open to see the people around us, our hearts being opened and, and loving those whom Jesus loves. And so today I want us to talk about how do we live generous lives with our hands open. And so for you and me, that's what I want us to talk about. That's what I want us to apply to our lives in this Christmas season. See, here's what I know. Christians from the very beginning... When Jesus left, he gave them a mission. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them the Bible and baptizing them, right? This was our purpose. This was our mission. From the very beginning, Christians recognized that they were to live with their hands open, that they were to live with their minds open, with their eyes and hearts focused on what God would love and on what God would see. And they practiced generosity, not just in their tithing, but in their uh, in their lifestyle. They believe something really important I feel like you and I need to believe as well. They believe that everyone mattered to God even if God didn't matter to them. Everyone matters to God even if God doesn't matter. To them. If you're in the room this morning, you're like, I don't give two rips about God. Fantastic. I'm glad you're here. Because I believe that you matter to God even if you don't think so. And so for this New Testament church, when Jesus left, they embodied this. They, they open up their high. Let me tell you how. Let me tell you one of the most disturbing trends in the Roman uh, culture. In, in the first and second century, what the Romans would do if they didn't want their babies was they would take them to, the part of an, out, to an outside part of town and leave them there. And they called this exposing the baby. In essence, what their idea was, their mantra was they were exposing the baby to their fate. Whatever the fate of the baby was is what the baby was intended to be. If that went that the baby was going to die, then the baby was going to die. That was their fate. If the baby was going to live, then the baby was going to live. That was their fate. Whatever their fate was, they believed that that was going to happen regardless. Now, they left them there for a bunch of reasons. Economic reasons, birth defects, not the right gender. Like, you doesn't matter. They didn't have to have a reason. They just took the baby, they put it on the outside of town, and basically said, good luck. What Christians began to do was go to these places, these designated locations where the babies would be, and get them, and raise them, and, and begin to, to raise them to love Jesus. It is incredible, because Christians in that society bought into the fact that they ought to live with open hands, and open hands means that they're waiting for something, right? So this is how Christians live. It's incredible. Now, as a church, we talk about generosity not because we need your money, as Matt said, we don't. That's not what we're here for. We're here because we don't want to rob you of an opportunity to experience the joy of generosity. We don't want to rob you of the opportunity 
to change somebody's day, life, year. Like you have an opportunity when you're generous to be a part of changing somebody's story. So what sets us apart? Here's what I've come to know as truth. That you do not have to be a Christian to be generous. Honestly, don't be offended. There are a lot of people who aren't Christians who are way more generous than Christians. Here, here's, here's, what I, here's what I think. Mm, don't, please don't hate me for this, but it's fine if you do. I think the reason why is because Christians are only generous to the people they want to be generous to. People only, only, I will, Kim, because these people need to hear it again. No, I'm just kidding. People need to be generous. Or, sorry, Christians are not generous because they're only generous to the people that they want to be generous to. So let me tell you what that means. You know, look like me, talk like me, act like me, believe like me, think like me, dress like me. If I can't see your lives all together, I don't want to be generous to you. And when what the early Christians believed was that generosity was an overflow of generosity that they had been received. So let's talk about two things that set us apart. This morning, I want to talk about two things that set us apart, our motive and our methods. I want us to look at a passage that maybe you wouldn't think about for a good generosity message, but I want us to look at Exodus chapter 35. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to flip there. Exodus chapter 35. We're going to sit there for a couple of minutes this morning. We're talking about what it looks like to be generous with our hands open. To give a little backstory into Exodus 35. Basically what's happened up to this point is the people of Israel have been put in slavery in this country of Egypt for a couple of hundred years. And God, finally hearing their cries, sends this dude named Moses. And Moses performs these ten plagues with, through, through God's power. And after those ten plagues, the Egyptian pharaoh says, get out. I don't want anything to do with you. And it's in that that we kind of find them now, just out of slavery. And it's crazy because the whole time, God wants to create a nation that points back to him. If you were to read through the plagues today, I'd encourage you to. It's super great. All the plagues, when God says to Moses, go and do said plague, go and bring boils, go and bring locusts, go, whatever. At the end of it, he always says, so that they will know that I am the Lord. God never, God never is out in the business to hurt. He's in the business of people knowing that he is powerful and that he is God. So take a look. Exodus 35 we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. I'm going to kind of jump down through this large chunk. So just kind of hang with me. It'll be on the screen as well. So start at verse 4. It says, Then Moses said to the whole community of Israel, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take a sacred offering for the Lord. Let those with generous hearts present the following gifts to the Lord. And then if you were to look through the next chunk, he kind of lists out all these different things, like gold and silver and onyx and all these different things. And then look at verse 10. Come, all of you who are gifted craftsmen, so maybe you don't have all of those things, but you got skills. Come on. Construct everything that the Lord has commanded. And then in the next 10 verses, it kind of breaks down like what that looks like. Here are some tasks that we have. And then look at verse 20 and 22. 20 through 22. It says, so, so the whole community of Israel left Moses, returned to their tents, and all whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought their sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, for the performance of its rituals, and for the sacred garments. Both men and women came, all whose hearts were willing. I love that. And then verse 29. So the people of Israel, every man and woman who was eager to help in the work the Lord had given them through Moses, brought their gifts and gave them freely to the Lord. You have this kind of epic giving campaign to kind of build what's known as the tabernacle. It's the, the place of worship. For people to come and to see who God is. It's incredible. And so this, this incredible giving campaign breaks out amongst the people of Israel. And day after day, for an extended period of time, they're bringing all of these things. They're working. They're building. They're doing to the point where actually it gets to the point where Moses says, stop. stop. I don't know what to do with all of this. Could you imagine? Just imagine. If Matt walked up one morning and was like, okay, guys, stop. We're just, we don't, know, we don't know what to do with everything you guys. We have too many volunteers. We have too much money. Y'all just y'all stop it. 
We would never say that. <laughs> and not because we're money hungry. That's not the case. But because we as a church believe that there are always people outside of our church who need help. There's always an opportunity for us to serve. It'd be a lot cooler if Matt came up and said, hey guys, great news. Poverty is eradicated. Homelessness is over. And Jesus is coming back. Because that's the only thing that's going to cause those things to happen. That'd be a cool Sunday. So make sure you don't miss that one. You're going to want to be here. Be here for all those. So we begin to see that the people of God are marked by generosity. That they begin to, to fulfill what God has called them to do in abundance. So I want to talk about these two things. First, let's talk about the motive. The motive of generosity sets us apart from the world. You don't have to, I said earlier, you don't have to love Jesus to be generous. Right? So what sets us apart as a generous people? I'll say this, that the motive of generosity, part of it, is that the people of God, find, it finds its roots in the generosity of God towards his people. What motivates us is not a guilty conscience, right? It's not like we're trying to earn God's favor. It's not that we're trying to validate ourselves as good people. That's what the world attempts to do, right? Think of it, especially this time of year. I need to go serve at a soup kitchen so I can feel like I've done something good. Hey, do you guys need any money? Because I want to I wanna get a tax write-off. I need people to see how good my business is at giving. All right, we, we get into this mode where we begin to think like the world almost. Like, i got to be a better person, or God's not going to love me as much. Or, but that's not our motivation. Our motivation is rooted in the generosity that God displayed towards you and I. Now, let me tell you what that means for, for you and I. You see, if, if I go, anybody watch that football game last night? If, y'all, if any of you Redskins fans in here, get out. I don't care about the Redskins. The only football team that matters in this house, in the Lord's house. <laughs> Redskins lost anyways. No Redskin wants to talk about it, right? But the Ravens, I mean, come on. The Ravens, what is up? We're going to win the Super Bowl. Uh, that's bold. Don't, you know what? If you're watching, don't, don't, don't cut that out. But we're not going to do that. But that'd be great. That'd be fantastic. But here's the thing. When you go and watch a movie or you watch a game or you're, you have a great date with that, you know what I mean? Like, this is high schoolers to a T, right? You're going to get on a great date with that boy or that girl. And then they're, like, Snapchatting or texting their friends. Like, oh, my gosh. He's so perfect and beautiful. Oh, my God. Oh. He bought my dinner at, like, McDonald's. <laughs> like, okay, look, first of all, whoa, first of all. If your man takes you to McDonald's for that first day, you need to break it off right away. <laughs> break it off. Yeah, y'all dine and dash before you take her to McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? All right. Anyway, so, so look, it's out of that overflow of excitement that we often share what's on our hearts. And this is what generosity is. Generosity is the overflow of our recognition of what God has done in our lives. It's an overflow of the recognition of his sacrifice for us. It's an overflow of seeing his generosity towards us. We're going to talk about more of that in just a second, but here's the deal. Like, when we begin to see this, it shifts our motives. The other part of this motivation is recognizing that everything that we own is already his. Like, everything that we have been given is given to us as a gift from God, and this is what I love about this passage in Exodus. These guys just came out of slavery, And when they left Egypt, God said, plunder all of your leaders, plunder all of your masters, take everything that you want, and leave. And so everything that God is asking them for has literally been given by him. And so their response is like, well, you already gave it to us, we might as well give it back. But here's the cool part. For you and me, what often happens is we look at a story of Exodus And we go, well, that's not me, Chris. God didn't give me everything. I've worked hard for the money. I work hard every day at work. That's great. I don't care if you work hard at work. You should work hard at work. That's why it's called work. Like, to the glory of God, work hard at your job. But recognize the job and the paycheck that you receive are a gift from God, not from your boss. And so for you and for me, we have to understand something really significant. 
that when we see everything that we have as a gift from God, whether that's money, time, talents, or treasure, whatever it is for you, it shifts our motivation. It changes the way that we think. And, and here's what I'll tell you. There are a lot of people who work just as hard as you and don't make the money you make. That's the grace of God to you. So you earned nothing that wasn't already entrusted to you by God. It's all his. Everything you have, everything I have, it's all his. Our response, our motivation should be to give it back to him. So let's kind of put this all together, kind of give you one big statement to go with it. Our generosity, our motive, is because we are a recipient of God's generosity. All we have is God's, and we want to steward it well because it's not ours. And check this, this little comment at the end, I hate this last line. I do it. I, I hate it. And we will be held accountable. We held accountable for how we steward God's resources. I'll tell you the worst part of what me and Matt and Dustin and this staff have. Let me tell you the worst part. Is that one day we're going to stand before God. If you're worried, like, what's that church doing with that money? One day we're going to stand before God, and God's going to hold us accountable. To how we use the resources that you gave this church. Not only that, but God's also going to look and go, how did you steward the resources I gave your family? So we get like a double punch, which is not fun at all. Nobody likes to be punched once, let alone twice, right? But you and I, with the resources that God's given us, are going to be held accountable for what we've done with them. How we've stewarded the gifts, talents, and abilities that you have. How you've stewarded the money and resources that you've been given. You know, I, I, and let me just say, like, I didn't really understand the generosity of God until my son was born. Like when my son was born and I held that kid, like right, I didn't hold him like this because his head would flop back, but I, I don't know. It's, I don't really know what I was doing as a dad. It's fine. So I, was, I was holding him some way. Right? But I look at him I'm like, why in the world would God give me this kid? Like I have a track record for screwing stuff up. I have a track record for being a total looney tune. And yet God was like, how about a kid? That'll, that'll, that'll teach you. And I'm telling you, like, it was a game changer for me to see the generosity that God had lavished on me and my son and now my daughter as well. Like, what a gift that God has given me. And I am going to be held accountable for how I steward that gift, how I nurture that gift, how I care for that gift. So not only should our motivation uh, be, or not only should we be motivated by what God has done for us and what God has given to us and the accountability that's coming, but the other thing that makes us different is the method by which we are generous. Now, the method by which we are generous, let me just stop right here for a second and kind of, kind of have a, a, a little rabbit trail uh, sidetrack for a second. The temptation in this next part is for you to think that the only way for you to be generous is out of an abundance like, if I don't have more than I need, then I can't be generous. Let me just be super clear. That's not the case. I'm going to be incredibly practical with you, whether you have $10 million sitting in your bank account or 10 cents waiting for that payday. I know where you're at. I've never had the $10 million in my bank account. I don't know what that's like, but I know what it's like to be like, come on Friday. So how do you be generous? In both, in both facets of life. So I want to talk about three. One, spontaneous giving. This is pretty neat. Let me read you a passage out of Acts. Look at what happened. Acts 4 says, there, was no, there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Check this out. I love this. That these wealthy landowners had some extra land or an extra house or something. They were like, oh, there's a need. I'm going to sell it. I'm going to give you the money. You're like, well, I don't have that. I don't have an extra house or extra land that I can sell. Great, you got extra junk. All of us, look, as a society, we all got extra junk. If you got Christmas stuff, I'll buy it from you. Come on. <laughs> right, so you're like, I don't know how to be spontaneously generous. I can't just go sell something. God has gifted you with eBay, Facebook, and Craigslist. Use them to the glory of God to sell all your useless junk. Y'all checking with me? Come on, this is easy. You can be spontaneous. You just got to go downstairs into that dreaded basement area and go, uh, I don't even know what's in this box anymore, but it's gone. All right? Go into that storage unit, 
you know, to that old box spring that's 10 years old and be like, somebody needs a twin bed? I got one. Here you go. You can be generous without having to go spend a whole bunch of money. Just get rid of all the junk you have. Come on, I'll preach it to myself. So secondly, <laughs> not only spontaneous generosity, but secret generosity. This one's probably my favorite one. There's a cool passage in Matthew 6. It says this. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private. Your father who sees everything will reward you. I love this. Here's what happens. Uh, maybe you are in this position right now where you're like, God, I don't know where that next bit of money is going to come to pay my rent, pay my car, pay my utilities, whatever it is. And you're struggling, and then you're praying like, Lord, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to get on eBay. I'm going to get on Craigslist. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell everything I got that I don't need. And I'm going to trust that you're going to bring the rest. And then that check or that gift card or something shows up. You're like, what is this? Here's what's crazy about secret giving. This is why I love it. The beautiful thing about secret giving is that the only person that can get the glory is God. See, you get that, you get that gift from somebody. And you're like, man, I'm struggling. I don't know what's that. And you get that gift. And you're like, I don't even know where this came from. And it diverts the attention back to the one who originally gave it. Isn't that neat? There are people in this church, and I won't tell you their names because that would defeat secret giving, right? Who've come to me and said, Chris, if at any point a student comes to you and says, I can't go on X trip, regardless of the cost, you tell me who they are. You don't, I don't even know who, need to know who they are. You just tell me what they need, and I'll write you a check. I don't want them to know my name. I just want them to hear the name of Jesus. What? Now look, again, I'm not saying you got to be that person. You might be the person that's just praying for the secret generosity to come. And that's okay. Because your generosity doesn't need to come through your paycheck. Your generosity is going to come in a different way. In praising God for what he's done. Your worship is generosity. The last one, I want to spend a little bit of time on this one. Because it, it blows my mind. Is a sacrificial giving. I want to read one last passage to you. And this one, I'm telling you, it wrecked my soul this week. I hope it wrecks yours. Paul is writing to this church in Corinth about these churches in Macedonia. I want you to see what happens. Take a look at verse 1 in 2 Corinthians 8. It says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But... They are also filled with abundant joy. What? Can we just stop for a second? Y'all, I stub my toe and I'm not filled with abundant joy. Like, you know, it's really hard, and you guys will know this. It's really hard in a season where you're being tested to be filled with joy on the other side of it. It's really difficult in a season where you're wondering where that next paycheck's going to come from for you to go, Jesus, I'm super happy about my life right now. It is hard to live in that space. And yet, these guys, their motivation wasn't in what they had. It was in what they were given. That's how they found their joy. This is their testament of many troubles. They're very poor, but they're also filled with abundant joy, which is overflowed, there's that word again, in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. Look at, y'all, just look at these next three words. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift of the believers in Jerusalem. What? These people who on the surface, you and I would go, if we're tested and we have troubles and we're having difficulty, we are angry. We're mad. We're frustrated. We're not like, I can't wait to serve in kid boy. But these guys were begging to serve in whatever capacity they could. Because they recognized the gift that they had been given and their motivation came out of that, out of the overflow of what God had given them. 
Could you imagine a Sunday morning where Jen came in and told us, hey guys, look, I can't take any more people up here. They'd be begging to be a part of what God is doing in Kid Point. Like, it would be incredible for all of our host teams to be like, look, we're, people are begging us to join our teams. We can't do it. People just want to be a part of what God is doing. That is out of an overflow, an abundance in our lives. I just want to encourage you, if you've never been, like, out of America before, I'm not talking about, like, watching a documentary. That's fake news, all right? They show you the pretty parts in the documentary, right? This is the toughest part. And it's like a kid with a soccer ball, right? And you're like, all right. I want you guys, I want to encourage you to go. Like, I know Pastor Matt is is working through some adult mission trips, short-term trips, week-long, 10-day, whatever it is. Can I just encourage you to go on one of those and, and watch people who aren't pursuing what you're pursuing and watch how they find their joy? It's kind of crazy. Do you know what I love? So we're taking our high schoolers to South Africa this year. And uh, they're going to serve in a really, um, hmm, not so super high-end part of town. They're going to serve with people who, you know, aren't quite what you would think of when you see the cute pictures of kids you should adopt, right? In a really run-down and broken part of town. But you know what they're not going to say when they come home? Boy, I wish I had my Nintendo Switch. Boy, I wish I had my iPhone. Boy, I I hope all my Snapchat streaks are still going. Do you know what what they come home and say? It's life-changing. Like, I, they they found joy in such brokenness. And I get frustrated when I don't have Wi-Fi. I don't know what I'm talking about. Don't act like it's not you too. Right? So, not only do we, do we show that sacrificial giving, but we have this opportunity to show spontaneous and secret. So let, me just, let me just pause for a second. And I want to I talk specifically to those people who, who are in the room who feel overwhelmed. Maybe these last four weeks of this generosity series have not been exciting for you. They've been crushing for you. Like they've destroyed you. Because you can't be generous in your mind. Maybe, maybe you have, have leveraged too much debt on your, on your property or on your student loans or, or you have some medical bills. Like, I know what that life is like. I get it. We're in that life right now. Our son, I feel like, is God's gift to the medical system. It's ridiculous. I love you if you ever watch this down the road. But that dude's in the hospital, I feel like, more than nurses are. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy. But here's the deal. Even in the midst of all that, you can still be generous. So don't take these last four weeks and go, well, because I don't have any money, I can't be generous. No, maybe your opportunity to be generous is in getting your financial situation fixed. You know, I've found that pride is often the part that stops us from being generous. I get it. I'm a dude. I don't want to ask nobody for help. But I have to. Do you know why? Because I stink at money. You will never hear me get up here and do a budget talk. It's not going to happen. You know why? Because I think that budgets like rules are meant to be broken. And that is my problem. That is my burden. And I'm really bad. I'm just, I'll just be super transparent. I'm really bad with money. But God is teaching me through men who are investing in my life how to not be such an idiot. And that's a good thing for me. And it, maybe it's something that you as well need. And we have people here who are ready to help you get the financial help you need. And I'm not talking writing you a check. I'm talking about helping you learn how to actually balance books and figure out how to actually keep track of your budget. Look, it's like weight loss, right? I can go and have surgery. More than likely, I'm going to gain it back. It's the people who have a lifestyle change that actually change their lives. (laughs) So what does that mean for you and for me? Well, I want to close out with kind of what we close out with every week. It's kind of what now, God. Like, what what is our next step? I think first and foremost, you have to recognize that God wants to set us apart. God wants to set you and I apart. God has a a plan and a purpose for you and for me. And maybe this morning you're in the room, and you don't even have a relationship with God. 
your motivation for giving is just because you hope somebody thinks you're great. And I want to encourage you this morning to start this season of Christmas off by recognizing that God wants to have a relationship with you, that he sent Jesus here to start a relationship with you, to restore what was broken and to make right what was wrong. You have an opportunity this morning to start Christmas in the way that it should be started, which is a relationship with Jesus. Maybe this morning that's not you. Maybe you are a Christian, but you need to start in a different way. God wants to set you apart by being practical in your generosity. Now, what that means is, I don't want you to go out today and give away a bunch of money. That's fine if you do. But maybe there are other ways that you can be practical. Maybe there are ways like praying for your waiter or your waitress at lunch today. Maybe there are ways like going out and asking somebody in the lobby, hey, can I pray for you today? Are you doing okay? It's easy for us. You know what I've found is that generous people engage people. Generous people don't go, I can't wait to spend all my money. Generous people look and say, can I pray for you today? You look like you're struggling. Generous with your time. Hey, can I serve you in some way, shape, or form? Oh, your house? Is, oh, you got a water leak? Let me come down there and fix that for you. Use your talent. Maybe you've got money. Great. Hey, you need, let me, let me help you out. Let me write you this check. Great. But at the end of the day, that's one-third of the two-thirds of generosity. Use your time and use your talent. Allow God to set you apart. Let us become a church that is marked by generosity more than anything else. So that's one. Maybe, and for us, I think, maybe we think, we overthink it. There's a church in Florida that initiated this, uh, this thing amongst their student ministry called Sandman. It's really cool. See a need, meet a need. They would take their students, send them out in the community, and say, go find people who have a need and go meet it. Find a way to meet it. So that could be something as small as taking a shopping cart from an elderly lady at Walmart and walking it back for her. Or walking that cart out and loading the groceries in her car for her. Or maybe buying those groceries. Like whatever that looked like. They use their time, their talent, and their resources, and their, sometimes even their money to go and to bless other people, to find a need and to meet that need. And this was revolutionary within their student ministry. It took over the church and it became this massive thing throughout their entire community that they knew that that church was marked by this Sandman idea that if they saw somebody, they were going to see a need, they were going to meet a need. It became their culture, which is huge. So how, how do we get there as a church? Isn't that... Isn't that like idealistic thinking, Chris? I'm glad you asked. It's not. In, uh, in 117 AD, there was this Caesar named uh, Hadrian. Hadrian Caesar uh, was fascinated with the Christians. He couldn't figure out why they were so different from everybody else. And so he, spent a, he sent a spy in. Now, why early New Testament names are so difficult to pronounce is far beyond my understanding of the Greek and Hebrew. I wish there was people just like Steve in the Bible, but there's not. This guy, I'm going to do my best for you, and that's all I got. Uh, Astrid's, I'm going to go with Astrid's, this service. I think that's, I think that's fair. So he sends this by Astrid's into the, into the Christian community. He says, I want you to figure out why they're so different. What's setting them apart? And so Astrid sends this letter back to Hadrian Caesar. This is what he says. He says, they love one another, and he who has gives to him who has not, without boasting. And when they see a stranger, they take him into their homes, and they rejoice over him as a very brother. And if there's any among them who are poor and needy, and if they have no spare food, watch what happens. They fast for two to three days in, in order to supply to the needy their lack of food. What? I don't have any money to buy groceries. Well, then stop eating for two days and give those away. That's not a real command, but you should do it. That's cool. Look at this. Such, O king, is their manner of life. And verily, this is a new people. Watch this last line. And there is something divine about them. Oh, man. Could you imagine? people in this community said there's something divine about that guy. I don't know what it is. There's something divine about what's happening at that church. This isn't a fairy tale. I, I didn't read this. This is real. This happened. This is a real letter. The people of God were marked by generosity. Why couldn't that happen again? The, the same spirit that indwelt them indwells you and me. The same God who was alive then is alive now. 
We can equally be a people marked by generosity if we recognize that we don't have to give all of our money to do it. We can give our time, our talent, our resources. We can be a people with open hands saying, God, I don't know what you're going to have me do today, but I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to serve. I'm going to love. I'm going to pray. I'm going to give. I'm going to do everything I can to see your name made great because you have been made great in my life. It's out of that overflow that we share. So what do you need to do today? What step do you need to take today? Maybe for you, it's starting that relationship with Jesus. That's where you need to start. You need to get out of this room and say, I need Jesus. I don't know where else to go. I've tried to find satisfaction in giving money and giving time, and none of it fills the hole that's in here because that hole isn't filled with good deeds, friends. It's filled with Jesus alone. Or maybe there's another way for you this morning. Maybe it's not that, that you need Jesus. Maybe you have Jesus, but today you need to go find some help to get your finances in order. You need to go and seek out help to actually get your life in a, in a place where it's manageable so that you can actually be generous with your time instead of being stressed all the time or frustrated all the time. Or maybe for you this morning, it's a commitment to kind of this new wave of generosity. Let me tell you what that means for you and for me. What that means for you and for me is that we are going to commit to say, you know what? I'm going to figure out ways for me to be generous. One of those ways is in tomorrow night. Tomorrow night at our Christmas Eve services, we're going to take up a, a special offering. And that offering is going to go solely to be generous in 2019. That's it. We want to take that money and pay it forward so that we can continue to be generous. And you're going to see some stories tomorrow that are pretty incredible with the money that's already been given up to this point. It's incredible how God's worked it out. But maybe this looks like for you something more practical today. Maybe, maybe you're like, I can't give extra. But what I can do is I can go to lunch and I can pray for my server today. Or I can reach out to that person that I've, I've been at odds with over the last few weeks. And today I'm going to restore that relationship. I'm going to begin to turn my affection back to Jesus who restores our relationship even when I'm like this with him. We have the opportunity to be generous in many more ways than opening up your wallets today. And if you're opening up your wallets hoping to buy God's favor, he doesn't want it. He wants you. You alone. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve you, to give, to be generous, to be a, a community of believers that will be marked by generosity. God, I pray that you would be with each person in this room. Give them a clear vision for what you would have them to do. God, I pray that you would give them clear opportunity to be generous, that we would have renewed minds and eyes and hearts to see and to hear and to feel what you would have us to do. God, that we would have our hands open say, God, we're ready to receive from you. God, may you fill us this Christmas season with joy that only comes from you. And God, if there's anyone in here this morning that just said, man, I have no joy. I've tried and tried to do all the good things I could, and I still come up empty. Jesus, I pray that you would, you would break them this morning for you. Help them to see that it is you and you alone that will satisfy them. In your name we pray. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, Please remember, you belong at ACC.